Hi everybody. Welcome to Universe View Odyssey channel. Dialogue concerning the EPR argument 3, the Bell's theorem and the aspect experiment. Q1. We're looking at one of the great debates in the history of physics, the Bohr-Einstein debates, and today it's time to wrap up the heart of this debate, the EPR argument. Last time we took a look and overview of the EPR argument, David Bohm's EPR argument adaptation, and Bohr's defensive logic. How does this debate progress? This debate seemed to have fallen into a labyrinth because no clear match had been made even after the publication of Bohr's refutation thesis. But in 1964, 29 years after the EPR argument was raised, British physicist John Bell presented a physical method that could confirm the EPR argument, and this debate has taken a new turn. 18 years later, French experimental physicist Alan Aspect succeeded in an experiment using Bell's methodology, and the truth-falsity of the EPR argument was determined. Q2 I think John Bell's achievements in transforming philosophical debates, which are difficult to determine clearly, into mathematical physics problems that can be discredited with certainty are remarkable. Could you briefly introduce Bell's achievements? Regarding John Bell's achievement, physicist Henry Stapp praised it as the most profound discovery in the history of science, and David Merman said, anybody who's not bothered by Bell's theorem has to have rocks in his head. Q3. I'm more curious about how profound John Bell's theorem is. The EPR thought experiment, performed with electron-positron pairs. A source, center, sends particles toward two observers, electrons to Alice, left, and positrons to Bob, right, who can perform spin measurements. The focus of the EPR argument is to bring twin particles into a thought experiment and prove that the uncertainty principle is fallacious. The uncertainty principle states that two complementary physical quantities of a particle, e.g. position and momentum, energy and time, angle and angular momentum, etc., cannot be accurately measured simultaneously. However, Bell slightly expanded the uncertainty principle and said, if there are three or more properties that cannot be measured simultaneously, i.e., if one of the three cannot be accurately measured, the other two properties cannot be determined, the existence of these physical quantities can be experimentally confirmed. Do you remember? Bohm's adaptation of the EPR argument, thought experiment introduced in the previous video. This means that the original EPR can clearly grasp the position and momentum of the other particle at the same time through one pair of particles. However, according to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, since the wave function of a particle spans the entire universe, the act of observing the position of the twin particle S1 affects the momentum of S1 and at the same time affects another particle S2. In order to avoid this difficulty, the Bohm's adaptation appeared, replacing position and momentum with spins. Q4. So, I guess John Bell got a hint for the Bohm's adaptation. Perhaps it was. Importantly, Bell's discovery could be adapted directly from Bohm's adaptation. The adaptation is also called the EPR Bohm argument and the thought experiment of related twin particles S1 and S2 can be applied as it is so that the spin is conserved. In this case, if you measure the spin of S1 and it is one half, you know that the spin of S2 is minus one half without measuring it. This is because the two pairs of particles S1 and S2 are related such that the sum of their spins equals zero. If we turn it into an everyday quiz, it goes like this. There are two pouches, one with red marbles and the other with blue marbles. Now, when you pick up a pouch, there's a 50% chance of getting a red marble in it, right? If this is confirmed, the other pouch should contain a 100% blue marble. This is the logic of EPR. In other words, the spin of S2 was determined regardless of the spin measurement of S1. However, we know from the Stern-Gerlach experiment and the spin conservation thought experiment we looked at earlier that this is not necessarily the case for related twins. In other words, if you immediately measure the spin of S1 again, you may get not only minus one half as before, but also one half. Regardless of the first measurement, it comes out with a 50% chance. Q5. In the case of twin particles related so that their spin is conserved, you can know the other by measuring one, and EPR says that it was originally set that way, and Bohr claims that the measurement of S1 is the result of being influenced by S2. Now, today's conclusion, how to figure this out. 
Shall we go one step further with John Bell's theorem? The mathematical method devised by John Bell is called Bell's inequality. According to this, if a particle has all three spin components definitively as EPR claims, the probability that the sum of the two spin components of the paired particles S1 and S2 is conserved. That is, if S1 is one half, clockwise rotation, then S2 is the calculations were made that the probability of getting the opposite minus one half, counterclockwise rotation, must exceed 50% of the total number of runs. So, if the spins of the two particles are conserved, the spins differ, 50% or less, then the EPR claim is wrong. This is Bell's great discovery as a realistic test to determine whether a particle has a definite spin about any axis. Q6. When you measure two particles at the same time, if the spin is conserved, with a different sign, more than 50%, the EPR wins, and if it is just 50% or less, ball wins. I still haven't reached 100% understanding. Please explain John Bell's theorem, Bell inequality, a little more. Bell adopted both realism and locality, which are the basic assumptions of the EPR experiment, and studied the correlation between the results obtained when measuring two particles to distance from each other simultaneously under the premise of local reality. As a result it is said that if quantum mechanics with its inherent uncertainty was correct, it was possible to make certain experimental predictions that could never be met. The mathematical expression of this prediction is Bell's inequality. To explain further, if Einstein's idea of the local world is correct, Bell's inequality satisfies the actual experimental results. But if Bohr is correct, this inequality breaks. In other words, Bell created an inequality that natural phenomena must satisfy if Einstein's local reality assumption is correct, that is, if Einstein's belief about nature is correct. Q7. If Einstein's belief about nature, namely, local reality, does not work, nature will not satisfy the Bell inequality. I don't know the details, but this sentence alone makes the discovery of the Bell inequality a great achievement. But now we'll have to do a physics experiment to see if it actually satisfies the inequality. Can you introduce the process? Since Bell's inequality came out, numerous experiments have been attempted to confirm the result in the world physics community. Among them, the experiment by Alan Aspect's team in France in 1982 is considered the most successful. Aspect and his colleagues hit calcium atoms with a laser to create twin photons, then sent each photon in opposite directions and passed it through a special filter. The pair of emitted photons, spin 1 or minus 1, are perfectly correlated to have the same spin. In other words, the Aspect team experimented with photons instead of electrons, spin 1 half or minus 1 half, in the EPR Bohm argument. In this experiment, if the detectors are set equally to measure spin about the same axis, the spin of both photons will always show the same value. The Aspect team conducted an experiment by randomly changing the settings of the two detectors as Bell suggested. If Bell's inequality is applied to this experiment, if the particle has three spin components definitively, as EPR claims, the cases where the two detectors show the same spin value must exceed 50% of the total number of trials. Each photon encounters a two-channel polarizer whose orientation, A or B, can be set by the experimenter. Emerging signals from each channel are detected and coincidences of four types, plus plus, minus minus, plus minus and minus plus, counted by the coincidence monitor. What was the result of Aspect's experiment? The results of this experiment, published in 1982, surprisingly showed the same spin value for both detectors only 50% of the time. That is not more than 50%. Bell's inequality is not satisfied. It was Einstein's defeat. Q8. It's dramatic. Exactly 50%. Nature is different from Einstein's beliefs. Bell's inequality is not satisfied. Can you explain the meaning of this experiment result? Since the Bell inequality is based on local reality as an axiom, not satisfying it means that one or both of the reality and locality of the EPR argument are wrong. In other words, when we interpret nature, we must give up either locality or reality. To preserve locality, the great principle of relativity theory that it is impossible to transmit information faster than light between spaces and the principle that the states of two particles are separated by space are kept, but reality must be abandoned. Conversely, 
In order to preserve physical reality, locality must be abandoned, that is, non-locality must be acknowledged. The standard interpretation of quantum mechanics by Bohr and others generally corresponds to the case of keeping the physical reality and giving up locality, recognizing non-locality. It is said that the aspect team's experiment actually showed non-locality. Photons flying in opposite directions passed through filters and directed to one of two polarizers, and aspect team confirmed that the photon matched its own polarization angle with that of its partner photon. This polarization angle is the spin. As pointed out above, this means that superluminal communication, which Einstein's special theory of relativity declared impossible, has occurred, or that two photons are non-locally interconnected. Most physicists refuse to accept the superluminal phenomenon, so Aspect's experiment is credited with effectively proving that there is a non-local connection between the two photons. Q9. Wow, that's amazing. The fact that photons, light, without any consciousness are connected to something and act to match the polarization angles with each other. But again, Einstein was defeated. This defeat, of course, was not confirmed during his lifetime, but it was not simply a defeat but it further strengthened the position of the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics, contrary to the original intention. In particular, Aspect's experiment shocked the physics world because it strongly eloquently demonstrated that the universe is not local, contrary to Einstein's belief. Q10. The results of the Aspect experiment seem to have had a great impact on physics. Many follow-up experiments were run, but did they produce the same results? In the Aspect experiment, the spatial distance between two photons was about 137 meters, and I recently heard that it was successful at a distance of 6,000 kilometers from China to Austria. It is said that sooner or later, experiments with related particles will be carried out on the Earth to the Moon. Anton Zeilinger demonstrated an experiment in quantum teleportation in 1998. It's an experiment that uses quantum entanglement to transfer quantum states to other particles far away. As you know, John Clauser, Alan Aspect and Aitan Zeilinger, who experimentally confirmed quantum entanglement, won Yoeyeo Awae Q11. It's really mysterious that there's an unknown connection between two particles that are so far away. Please introduce the interpretation and meaning of physics. The conclusion of this experiment and subsequent research is that, if two objects are quantumly correlated, the influence of one is instantly transmitted to the other beyond space. Physicists call this phenomenon, quantum entanglement. This is a conclusion that many physicists have reached after much effort, but it is also true that it is not easily convincing. However, as far as experimental evidence is concerned, we cannot deny this fact. It is clear that this universe is very different from the universe we thought before, different from Einstein's universe. So, this era is the era of the, network universe view that believes that all objects and spaces in the universe are closely connected. Next time, I will introduce a new view of the universe of the 21st century, the network of universe view. Thanks for watching. You can read this story in Injury Time, injurytime.kr.